I want to say welcome everybody to this whole Wakanda Remembrance Chadwick Boseman Memorial. I think this is going to be an amazing, amazing time because really what we're doing is taking the opportunity to remember an iconic character that Chadwick Boseman played. And one of the reasons why I want to engage with this specifically is the fact that Chadwick Boseman has played so many characters that were real char characters. Thurgood Marshall, and he played Jackie Robinson, brought me closer to the people, but not necessarily to him. Mm. It was when he played T'Challa specifically that really enlivened me, it made me want to know more about him. And honestly, he was inseparable from the character. Much of who he was was in the part. So what we've done is brought together some friends of mine who are absolutely mm. amazing. And I think you're going to bring a really rich, lively discussion to uh, this topic of Black Panther, its social ramifications, so on and so forth. So mm. I want to introduce uh, John Bonaducci, right, uh, and Mr. Pete Wong, and we're going to have uh, Paul Alderman joining us a little later on in the uh, in the broadcast. So first, let's just start off with who mm. you are. Let's let's uh, let's start off with Mr. John Bonaducci. Just introduce yourself and tell us who you are. I've been studying mythology and the iconic heroes, uh, both historical and non-historical, for the last several years. I recently got my doctorate at my late age, um, mm. and maybe that's part of what brings me here today, and also an unusual, but very personal connection to the um, to the experience of Wakanda and uh, Bozeman in particular. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Pete Wong, <laughs> please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so I am a storyteller and filmmaker. Um, I recently have been focusing on health and wellness uh, developing uh, programs. And uh, I have a, a podcast called the Pete Wong Podcast that I post uh, every every week and uh, sharing a little bit something about how to live our lives happier, healthier, and more f with more fun. So uh, <laughs> I'm really glad to be here and, uh, and, and you know, it's an honor to, to share this, this, uh, this room, this space with, with all of you and uh, excited to, to see what, what comes out of it. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, I'm Orpheus Black. You know, I mean, I'm a I'm a lifelong martial artist, erotic educator, and uh, I work with couples. But I'm also a uh, Afro spiritualist, which means I subscribe to traditional African spirituality, hence the the garb, <laughs> and a Zen Buddhist. And um, mm. this is really super important to me as a person who connects with Afro spirituality and uh, also Afro martial arts. So I think this is going to be amazing. So let's start with a simple question. Let's just throw it out mm -hmm. to the group. When did you first hear about Black Panther? Well, now, mm -hmm. I want to be the first to admit yeah. that Black Panther was not one of the superheroes that I read um, 55 years ago when I was reading comic books regularly. I like saying that. That's a, that's a long ass time. Right. Uh, that's over half a century. Wow. I should sit here in stunned silence. But anyway, I <laughs> I mostly read um, Superman, Superman comics, and I still know everything about Superman. I, I you know, all of the details, his father and where they came from and his weakness. And his character flaw is that he doesn't have one. He has a he has an, a vulnerability, yes, but not hmm. a character flaw. We would think that's bad literature, and probably is. Except <laughs> in Wakanda, he has no real character flaw either. He is all good. And I want to remind those who've forgotten that there was a time when little boys. I, I can only speak for little boys, but little boys could imagine someone is all good. And there he was. 
to chocolate. Oh. I think it's all good. It's all good. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. How about you, Pete? Uh, yeah, so just just like John, I, I also have to admit, um, you know, I, I think that I, I didn't know about Black Panther. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, maybe, maybe when the movies came out and that's, that was my first exposure to, to knowing about Black Panther and I knew nothing about his character and, um, but, uh, I, I, but I did know about when the film was coming out because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of Ryan Coogler and, um, I, I've been following him, you know, Fruitvale Station and Creed and, and I was like, if, if this guy's behind this film, like, I'm super excited because it's going to be more than just, I had a gut feeling it was going to be more than um, what what I was thinking or what, you know, superhero movies were, were known for at that time. So, um, so yeah, I'm pretty, I feel like I'm pretty fresh on that, uh, the Black Panther. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, <laughs> yeah. You know, he, he is an obscure character reference, and, you know, he was introduced as Marvel's Batman. That's really what he was, you know what I mean? Mm. But, you know, what, as a 46-year-old, as a when I came into comic books, um, I have to be honest that for a little black kid, when I was playing superheroes, I was playing white superheroes. I was playing, I was imagining as a black character that I was a white man saving the world. Right. And, you know, we would play these roles where uh, we would get in trouble and someone had to swoop down out of the sky and da -da -da -da, and do this thing. Right. Yeah. But it was always me as a white guy saving black character, huh. you know, saving black people and the long term ramifications of being in that space where it's always someone else saving you or you had to portray be someone other than yourself saving someone really for me was always a conflict. And then when you saw black characters back in the days, it was always kind of the 70s soul brother with the big fro. And growing up in the 80s, that wasn't necessarily who I was. And so we stayed with Spider-Man and Batman and Superman, these other characters, but never got a chance to really understand what it was. And then when they had this other character that was smart, had intellect, wasn't necessarily, a, you know, from an alien or something like that. He was just a guy who grew up and, and, and learned some skills and, and honed his craft through hard work and effort. It really changed my life, and it showed me if you work hard and you do it, you can be whatever you want, right? And so but by the time I got it, I was a little too old to envision that, and the character never caught on. And so I was always hoping that it would be a catalyst for people who were like me, who grew up like me, without that role model, without that inclusivity. And um, and then it came back in the second wave in the form of a movie, so that was super important, mm. you know, growing up. Mm. Right? Have you ever gone into a movie, this happens to me, or it still happens to me, where you've been watching your hero for two hours, and when you walk out, you feel your face is his face. Have you ever done that? Mm -hmm. Yes. I it happens to me all the time. Now it was, George Clooney. I mean, <laughs> I, I, it's not that I want to be George Clooney. He's a nice guy. He's really handsome, and he's right. an interesting character, and he's well built. And but that's not it. It's I've been watching him, and I guess processing his presentation, and I feel. His George Clooney face on my John Bonaducci face. I feel really cool about it too. Um, and another one was Clint Eastwood. Uh -huh. Now, right. I can imagine that, I mean, Clint Eastwood and I don't look anything alike, but then it's not unusual referring to your situation with mm. the white guy saving the black people, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was the character. That happened to me with um, every Denzel Washington movie I ever saw. I, I felt <laughs> Denzel's face on my face, and I never questioned it. I still do. And that happened with T'Challa, too. Oh. I mean, mm. that, that dignity and that power. And as I told you, it reminded me of my Superman all-good hero. No nuance. All good. Mm. Um, which is crazy. Nobody's all good, but... 
as an archetype, I guess we have room for it still. Anyway, so you're not alone, Orpheus, in that. Yeah. It, it's, I, I felt the black um, persona, like a suit of armor, and behind it is me, and there, you know, starting with uh, Denzel. So, can, speaking of archetypes, I mean, how, how archetypical is the T'Challa character, uh, mm-hmm. in your opinion? I mean, you know, it, as a person who studies um, storytelling, stories, folklore, mythology, how the Tatalic character, how archetypical is that, that character? Well, it's, it's interesting that all of our, that our two branches of psychology from Jung and Freud have settled on three components of uh, consciousness. And Jung's is, includes the archetype. But both are, are triples. They're, they're in triplicate. Uh, there's the ego id and uh, super ego for Freud. And then there's the personal unconscious, etc. And the archetype, Jung, I thought T'Challa kind of expressed the triplicate nature of Jung's archetypal psychology really well. Hey, you asked this this doctoral dissertation stuff. Or, <laughs> this is what you get. Is what you get. <laughs> we we love it. We love it. <laughs> okay. Well, remember, remember, everyone is not a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so let me give you my quick version of it. I see, I see um, T'Challa as a guy in triplicate, mm. ex- um, exhibiting the archetypal um, threesome, the trinity. Uh, we've got him in his suit, which is like the persona. And underneath we have Black Panther. He's always the Black Panther. Um, but then his unconscious is the next level in. Remember, he drinks the brew. Remember, it strips away. They say every time it strips away the Black Panther, and all that's left is so. There, there is the. He assumes the archetype, but he can also be just himself without benefit of the archetype. So that's how I see it. There's three hmm. in one. It's like any Catholic yeah. would recognize. Like matron, mother, crone, or in, uh, father, son, Holy Spirit. Or the three graces, three fates. Absolutely. Definitely. Mm. Pete, when it comes yeah. to storytelling, I mean, how do you feel, how do you feel Chitala as a character stacks up, uh, in, in your opinion, as far as a storyteller's perspective? How, how detailed is mm. a character in comparison to all the other characters? Well, I think what, what makes him, what, what makes Black Panther, uh, uh, interesting is that there's there's more than one. I mean, like you know, there, there's you know his father was was uh, uh, T- T'Chaka, right? Is that correct? Um, yeah. He was the Black Panther, and then after him, T'Challa had to take over. And and then what's interesting is like you, we get to see all these dimensions of T'Challa as far as he's the king, but does he does he want it can he handle it and and all the all the responsibilities that come with it and and uh i think what's fascinating is that we get to see that all the dimensions of this character and and in addition for me personally and i i don't know if we're going to touch on this later but since we're touching on it now um (laughs) i gotta tell you when i saw him on the screen uh i i felt really really moved because I, I mean, I didn't know much about the character, right? But then, uh, as a man, that's that's the purse that's the man I was like wanting to be, and mm-hmm. and I felt like seeing him on the screen, it gave me that opportunity to to, to feel uh, empowered, and and you know what I love about his character is that he's he's soft spoken. You know, he he doesn't need to he doesn't need to order you know or bark orders out. Um, at the same time, he's very vulnerable. He 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 doesn't have all the answers, and he seeks other other uh, supporters help. And so that's like another dimension. You know, you rarely see a king, um, especially in my culture, the 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 Chinese culture, you never see the king. 
uh, delegating. You never see the king, <laughs> like, the king is always, you know, on the throne by, by, by himself. And so I think, I mean, I, that's what I love about, about Black Panther and T'Challa is he represented a man that I, that I long to be and, and maybe I already am that person. So, yeah. so yeah. Mm -hmm. I think is what I think is important about uh, T'Challa as a character, as a character, is he's not quite any archetypal narrative, right? He's always sort of this and always sort of that. And I'll give you an example. He's also the reluctant hero, right? Because he was through in a situation where his father died, and now he has to assume the mantle immediately, and he has to assume it without his his uh, people going through the ceremony or doing all these things, he has to do it right away, right now. Fucking all tradition and kind of jumping ahead in the line, right? He doesn't get a chance to mourn his father in the very beginning. Right. He doesn't get a chance to carry him back to his country. He gets started right now. So there's a reluctance to being in these things. That's one thing. The other thing is, is most kings, as you say, sit on a throne. This guy's active hands-on person he's actively protecting his people he doesn't have anyone that's looking out for him or bodyguarding him in the suit right yeah. he brings forth everything and really this harkens back to the notion of um in an african mythology where the panther was an aspect of the hunter both the hunt the prey and the predator were one Right. And so when a person went out there and killed a black panther and wore his pelt or wore a cat made of his thing, he could actually turn into the black panther. So notice a lot of what the black panther did was hunting down. He hunted down his father's killer. Yeah. Right. He hunted for people. He's not the typical warrior. Right. He's a hunter, a proud noble. And I think that that was interesting. Then you also saw his progression from child, you know, his father's child, to a reluctant hero into the king and mantle, but it really wasn't, it really didn't fit him yet. We didn't get a chance to see him preside over the kingdom. Mm -hmm. We still saw him as one of the people. And this is really what kind of hurt me is that fact that we didn't get a chance to anoint him, to lift him up into that space to see him govern, to see him mature in the role of, of T'Challa and see where he could take the rest of the world. Because remember, he brought everybody out of Wakanda. He brought Wakanda to the rest of the world and said, we're going to start building this and we're going to start helping and we're going to start being a part of the world. We don't get to see that come to fruition. Well, that's that's typical. And uh, in, the, in the Christian scriptures, we get to see the mm. hero resurrected, but we have to apparently wait couple thousand years for him to come back and reign. Very typical. Uh, in the meantime, we're just in a holding pattern. So, and that's one of the, you were asking about the archetypal references uh, that fit this situation. Well, if our mutual friend John Booker were here, he would probably cite Joseph Campbell's uh, Hero with a Thousand Faces. And the whole cycle of the hero, which T'Challa fits so perfectly. Remember, there's always the reluctance on the hero's part. I'm sure you remember that. Always the uh, the refusal of the call. And then once he accepts the call, it's the descent in the underworld. Well, no one descended more obviously into the underworld than T'Challa when he went over those falls. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. Heartbreaking. And then when he comes back, he's resurrected yeah. and brings a boon for all humanity. That's what Campbell always said. And that's what puts... T'Challa slash Bozeman in the major mm -hmm. leagues of the world's heroes. He, he extends Wakanda's wisdom to the entire world. It is a boon for humanity, not just for himself or his nation or his culture. Good stuff. I also, I also want to reference when we talk about the underworld, he was also buried, right? So there was a symbolic death right. where right. We, we scoop him out, he's buried, He's, he goes to the other side to ask wisdom of oracles in the same way that many uh, of the uh, Greek and Roman uh, heroes would go 
to uh, climb Mount Olympus to speak to Zeus or to speak to the fates or something like this. So it's a type of journey to, to the other side to bring back this wisdom or to have the blessings mm. uh, of this other side to come back. So there's a dual layer of ascension. You know, I'm, I'm sorry, a, a dual layer of going into the underworld. So he went over the falls, which is symbolic of the underworld, but he also went, uh, ascended to the highest heights with, or their heaven. Does that make sense? It, mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. it does. So that was a, a very important thing to me uh, when we look at this. Um, when it comes to um, storytelling, I think another aspect was the characters that surrounded him. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we can see uh, something about the Amazon Amazonian type women that were around him, the Dora Milaje, and they kind of compare that to uh, Wonder Woman and the Amazonians there. What I think is really mm -hmm. important, as kind of uh, Patrice Rankin pointed out, is that in the Wonder Woman narrative, you could make an argument that it was kind of a, a Freudian fear of the phallus kind of mentality, which is why they kind of avoided men altogether. Whereas in the African tale, I, I believe uh, in Wakanda, both the Black Panther and the Dora Milaje understood that masculine, the masculine was incomplete without the feminine and the feminine was incomplete without the masculine. He was only so strong as one man, right? And really brought in the dual counterpart of the feminine into the space so that he could reign and, and bring balance to his environment. You'll also notice that when um, Killmonger came in, he came onto the set, and what happened was all the people he gave, he interacted with were pretty much men. He disrespected all the women, and when he was handing out, take this to the rest of the world, take these guns, take this, he, he gave men, all the men, the mission. Hmm. And did not try to conscript any of the women into what it, his plans. And that was a very Western ideal. Whereas Black Panther historically had embraced this idea of unity and, and, and togetherness with with regards to the masculine and the feminine. What and do you guys think about that narrative? It's a very primitive ideal too, to um, to exclude women from your conception of the heroic is very primitive. I'm from the early nineteen fifties. I my ideas about women were formed the way um, a, a fifty seven Chevy is formed. That's what my psyche looks like because that's that's when it was built so i've had to do a lot of uh aftermarket work on on my consciousness mm. Mm -hmm. and um so i recognize how primitive that is and how easy it is to make the jump once you have a character like um t'challa demonstrating the comfort and ease with which he moves through this uh bilaminar gender gendered world with two equal um partners it was beautiful and healing for me to see. Yeah, I I don't have too much to add to that, but um, I love that you use the word healing. Um, I think I've been wanting to see more of that. I've been I've been like yearning to see more women portrayed as um, as as the women that we that we know. You know, our mothers, our our, our grandmothers, and you know, our sisters and uh, daughters. Uh, three-dimensional whole and um, and it was also cool that they have the different um, the different archetypes within the, the the group of women like um, the sister right she was all about science and technology and um, and then uh, you have the the, the, the warrior um, with the spear and uh, so it's just interesting how that how that was another thing they 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 allowed time to uh, to show us these these characters, and you don't you don't see that a lot, you know. And and you know, I mean, a lot of people right now are are arguing about uh, these different Disney movies. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. I don't want to get anyone get anyone in trouble, but you know, Captain Marvel. I miss you. So. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Marvel and, you know, Ray from Star Wars, you know. So I just think that what we saw in Wakanda was something that I felt was more whole, was more, was more, I could, I, I wanted to relate with, with the, the world there. Um, and maybe that's the world that I, that I ideal want. You know, 
you know, one of the things they say about, uh, like, AI is that it doesn't have to look like human beings. People want to engage with artificial intelligence, with robots, with things like that. And so we are more than willing to meet you halfway. We're willing to humanize this thing. And I think when I went into the whole Black Panther movie, I wanted to, I, I, can, I was more than 50% in. I wanted to connect. I wanted to be there. I wanted to have the experience. And one of the reasons is, as a, as a person who grew up watching Star Trek, the very first one, to see that black woman sitting there, uh, Ahura, yeah. sitting there, it took my breath away. Because it, it said, from a literary standpoint, that people of color have a place in the future. You know, we had all these other people, but where, where was I? I, I where, I'm not being built into your future. People like me are not being built into your future. And there's one person, and at the time, that was enough. And then you watch the next one, and then we have Jordy, and maybe in, in some implications uh, through behaviors of some other aliens. But really, the only black person that was, next one was one black person. And I'm like, okay, we can do better than this. Where are the other ones? And then we got two. And then I'm like, hmm. where are we? And then we and I sat there and watched these people who are high tech and futuristic, hmm. and, and they're building their future without anyone else's narrative, without anyone else's idea, and they're taking themselves into the future. And I felt like, and I have to be honest about this, that from a literary standpoint, we weren't going extinct, or even from a literary standpoint, being exterminated. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you have to kind of think about this. If there's yeah. none of you, if there's only one of you and thousands of people on the ship, where, what happened to us? Where's the bad story, right? And for me, that was super important, important to be able to have someone to say, you're here, you're with the rest of us. Well, you know what, Orpheus, I, 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 I mm. must respond with the idea that, that the Ohura phenomenon, let's call it, mm -hmm. is, is alive and kicking in Black Panther. Only this time, it's the CIA agent. I get, uh, I know there must be a lot of people out there who, uh, white people, who are looking for a, a, a foot in to the <laughs> pond. Can I even go into this pond? Hmm. And right. Say, I can't go in? Mm -hmm. And then you see this guy, and he's not all wimpy. He, he, they push him around a little bit, but... They give him something to do, and he comes off heroically. If you remember Pete, right? He, mm. he kicks some butt in that in that movie. They let right. him save. Uh, they let him blow uh, blow up the uh, departing uh, spacecraft so that the world will be spared nuclear annihilation. <laughs> so I have a little foot in the door in Wakanda, and um, what was the actor's name? I, I don't remember. I forgot. That's the guy who did uh, Joe, uh, um, the zombie movie, uh, Shaun of the Dead. Um, and he also was in Sherlock Holmes uh, on that. Yes. Brilliant. Uh, oh, he's not Shaun of the Dead. You're right. He's from Sherlock Holmes. My right. bad. My so, bad. Orpheus, um, oh, the Ohura phenomenon, that we'll call it that, is alive mm -hmm. well, but it's been reversed mm -hmm. um, in terms of race. Yeah. You know, and... and Let's not let's not shy away from the, the heavy topic here because there is a lot of issues around race with both the movie, uh, inside the movie, inside the world, and and outside the world. Because when the movie was first released, um, there were death threats, you know, uh, bomb threats called in, um, you know, things saying that black people were beating up uh, white patrons, so don't go see it. I mean, there was so much racially charged, racial division uh, around this movie, you know, let's let's not avoid it, you know, let's put it out to the group. What do you think was the catalyst for this? Why was it so racially charged? Wow. Well, in, in hindsight, <laughs> uh, you know, doing doing my research after the movie, like, I, like after I like to watch a movie, it's like, oh, now read about it. <laughs> um <laughs> I really think it's it's the uh, the perspective 
or, or one of the things, I, I mean, I can only speak from, you know, what I think it is, but one of the things I think is the perspective that the team, uh, starting with the, the screenwriter and then collaborating with Ryan Coogler and then collaborating with the next person, the next person, the entire casting crew, um, that they wanted, uh, and, and, and I talked about this the other day, but, you know, Ryan Coogler, he had a question and he just wanted to answer the question for the movie. What does it mean to be African? What does it mean to be black? And that's huge. <laughs> and, um, and and he had he had the the, the Marvel uh, character Black Panther to to work with, but he had a plan, and and everybody you know wanted to support it, um, but you know, so so bringing the character from Oakland right the Eric Killmonger right to uh, somebody who who was not allowed to to uh, reap the benefits or uh, experience the same things as T'Challa and, you know, and other, other members in Wakanda. So I, I think it was an amazing uh, storyline. Uh, and I think that itself was controversial was we're, we're, we're going, we're going to talk about this thing and we're going to show you through this fictional character, through this, this, superhero but we're gonna attack it f for today and you know and possibly the future so hey <laughs> <laughs> well i want to welcome uh, mr paul alderman to the uh, to the group um, Hi, paul. you know we all got a chance to do our intro so let me just give you an uh, uh, why don't you just give us a little intro you know who you are what you do mm -hmm. and then i'll bring you up to date mm -hmm. on where we are in the conversation all right um uh... Paul, as uh, we have said, um, I work in the industry, uh, film myself, I work in the editorial side. Uh, um, yeah, I'm just contributing to uh, this conversation here. <laughs> so basically where we are in the conversation is, and I think this was a great opportunity for you to kind of segue in. All right. The question was, why was this so politically charged, both in, I'm sorry, uh, racially charged, mm -hmm. uh, both in the movie and outside of the movie. You know what I mean? There was so much, uh, we talk, I talked about the, uh, the uh, that there was stuff put out saying, you know, people were getting mm -hmm. beat up. If you go see White Pan Black Panther and white people were being assaulted and there were bomb threats called in and everything to really dissuade people from going to see this movie yeah, I think it was more racially charged than any other movie that I can think of, you know, without like Passion of the Christ or, or something like that. Right. Yeah. So why do you think that there was so much racial tension around the movie uh, to begin with? I, I think because it was just authentic. Mm. Um, I think uh, the filmmakers took authentic black experience and incorporated it into a, a you know, a major film, uh, a major film being like a Marvel project, you know, and to have it injected with, you know, everyday authentic black experience. And I keep coming back to that because uh, so often I think in film, like the uh, an authentic black experience, you know, it's uh, portrayed in a way that's, I don't know, just negative or it's very one dimensional. It's like for, ghetto neighborhoods or slave history, you know, and here the authentic black experience was being incorporated into a story with a future site of black people. Um, uh, and it was around a culture of black people that were uh, independent, you know, yeah. um, and you step back and you think like, oh man, that's, that's, that's nothing special, but uh, I personally, I, there aren't many, there weren't many black films uh, at that level that were doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what makes it racially charged. You know, you, you, uh, and then it becomes a conversation. Like, since you don't see that, then it's too black. 
know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, when I was seeing all these experiences, like, you know, black people have to like every conversation or relating to things, you know. Uh, there was so much, uh, uh, I guess, feedback and conversation just around the scene when uh, uh, Killmonger comes in, right? And he's challenging for the throne, right? He's in the throne room after they caught him, whatever. And he does like the auntie line. It's like, hi, auntie. Mm. After he does the reveal, right? And, you know, Black was exploded like, oh, he dropped the auntie on there. <laughs> 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 Like, what do you mean? What is that? Yeah. You know, but that little thing was too black. And all it was was like <laughs> a term of endearment to a relative that, you know, that folks around a lot of black communities and black families. Mm. And uh, I was like, just seeing like that, I don't know, was seen like a positive, authentic black experience. Uh, it, it was just jolting for people. It was outside of what they normally saw. You know, they weren't seeing, you know, the criminal. They weren't seeing... Right. Uh, the hood drug dealer come up story. They weren't seeing, you know, uh, the the heavily makeup black actor in another character, you know. Because mm. uh, I've been hit up with conversations like, "Oh, well, there's been black movies before." And I'm like, "Okay, like, you know, give me some examples. I'm, I'm listening to." You. Right. And like, what about uh, Blade <laughs> and Spawn? <laughs> and I was like, man. Spawn is a crispy dude. He could have been, you know, could have been a fucking Eskimo. He could have been an Eskimo. He was a giant dude. You know, you know, you know, can I, 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 I see John wanting to get in there too. And, <laughs> and I'm just going to point this out that I also want to throw out that, you know, with foresight, you know, you know, I'm sorry, hindsight being 2020, we can also be in this space where, uh, like uh, Trevor Noah said, that black skin is is inherent to having a weapon, you know, mm-hmm. to a lot of people, and that this idea that Black Panther, a person who robes himself in even blacker material, it, and the fact that his body is the weapon, is that it kind of also plays on that fear that we're kind of enhancing the offense of being a person of color, uh, enhancing the the fear of that color. You know, what I mean, the negative stereotypes are associated with blackness inherently which is another thing that i think kind of charged this thing john what do you what do you think about well i i just was reacting to something paul said the beauty of wakanda was that it was independent it was untouched by colonialism it was Mm -hmm. virginal it was pure and there was an intentionality not on just the producer's part not just on the marvel universe but bozeman Bozeman was uh, originally told that he, I don't know, I heard this from my son-in-law, so it's his fault if it's not true. <laughs> um, but uh, his, he was told and expected to do an Oxford British accent, uh, and which is very traditional. You know, Romans, ancient Romans are always yeah. like, you know, Cary Grant for some reason. Um, and... He said no. He said no. He he adapted dialects that he heard because if he had an Oxford accent, that means he was educated at Oxford and is a product of some other culture. That's what I was going to react to that Paul was saying. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think I think if we we kind of move it into the character too, the building of this character, um, the fact that they were autonomous, you know, what I mean, was a, a major role. But another is these kind of reoccurring themes that uh, that we've seen throughout history. I noticed that there was an undertone of Romulus and Remus uh, when you look at the two fathers, right? Mm-hmm. Where one father kills the other father, you know, and, and continues to build this thing up. So that was kind of this yeah. undertow that kind of carried on throughout the script. And then you see history re, uh, reinforcing itself where the brothers were, again, fighting. I mean, where um, the cousins, which, which is there... One had to fight the other, one had to kill the other. Again, we're in this Romulus and Remus thing because both have a vision of where the where the empire should be built, how it should be built, where it should be going, where how it's going to be carrying forth. And only one's idea was going to make it, and we had to make sure that the other one died. Hmm. Right? You'll see that same thing. Uh, this is a theme that, that uh, Disney does a lot. You'll also see in Lion King, right, where Scar had to make sure that the king dies or you could take it. 
you know, again, two brothers, Romulus and Remus. We see this over and over again. How many recurring themes did you think that you guys kind of noticed, uh, you know, maybe take borrowed from history or borrowed from folklore or borrowed now? Well, I've, I've got, that? I'm bursting to point out that this is a very, it, it resonates with the chivalric literature, uh, the knights' stories, because of the power of that suit. The knight's armor in the Arthurian legends has the same power, and it's the mm. same symbol. If you put on the right suit, you are the right man. Wow. And, um, that was Parsifal's experience, and Bozeman played a kind of Parsifal in that mm -hmm. suit. Wow. Mm. Were you uh, thoughts about that, Pete? Oof. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to follow up, John. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> uh, you don't agree or disagree and push it off on somebody else. If you <laughs> Pete, if you have any doubt, just say, John, that's complete bullshit. <laughs> and then anything you say after that is going to be just fine. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. Let me. Let me. Let me. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm good. I, I'm good on that question. But. Um, <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Paul? Uh, I, mean, I don't know if I can relate it to any kind of any kind of theme. Um, I think John made a you know a good one with that, that parcel reference um, as far as the suit, you know, because uh, you know suit was like this, this only one man wears that, you right? Know? Even though right. Like, each time it was only one man that always had it, and you know obviously it was the king, or in this case, in this culture, it was the king. Um, so you know there there is that reference. Um, but yeah, I had to chill on it a little bit more, uh, just to think about like any other reference that uh, that I can identify from any other form of literature or even another movie. Um, mm. Well, you know, there's also you know um, a lot of people liken this to the story of Cain and Abel too. When you look mm -hmm. at uh, when you look at uh, T'Challa and uh, Killmonger, because remember. When God said, you know, where's your brother? He said, I'm not my brother's keeper. And that was really a theme of the movie because, again, um, we have two we have two brothers that started this thing by him killing the, you know, killing his brother and then leaving the son and how is how the whole thing propagated. And then uh, remember, Cain uh, was trying to take uh, Abel's birthright. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And that's really what the story was about. And so Killmonger was coming to take his birthright. It wasn't necessarily about being king. It was about taking it from you. Your father took this from me and I will take it from you. You know what I'm saying? So that was about a taking. So I really see that there's some, some themes. I don't know if Kugler maybe put that in there, but the other thing that I think was really big was the fact that there was a discussion that was happening in that movie that we didn't have, that we never had in this culture separate from that. And that was, um, there's always, for me, at least been this undertone about Africans and blacks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. we're oh, here yeah. and you're there, and we never had this conversation about amongst ourselves about what happened. And you have Killmonger, who was raised here, and T'Challa, who was raised there, with this royal mindset, and this other person with this very gritty urban mindset, and then them coming together, and it was like, wow, we, you know, Hundreds of years have passed, and as a culture, as two cultures, we have never had this conversation. You know, the uh, Jewish community faces the same dynamic, and all, uh, perhaps as powerfully. I mean, there's the diaspora Jews mm -hmm. here in America, in Europe, mm -hmm. everywhere, and then there are the Jews who have performed, uh, undertaken Aliyah, and gone back to that homeland. It's it's the same tension, a global tension and a global source of creativity. And also, there's something in the whole American experience that is just heightened in, in the uh, African-American and African experience. But as an Italian-American, I mean, we're always being thinking about what we've gained and what we've lost, mm. both, um, you know, from the traditions of our uh, Catholic Roman heritage and what we are now. So this is not foreign to anyone, this dynamic of uh, a homeland. Uh, yeah. Not oh, at all. Oh, good. Uh, I, I, I just think, uh, or I feel, 
very, I agree very much with what Orpheus is saying. Like, it just hasn't been much conversation uh, as far as, like, how black Americans receive Africans and vice versa, how Africans receive black Americans. Um, you know, I was I actually have a similar conversation ongoing with uh, several friends who are um, from other countries. Uh, one's from Austria and another is from uh, France, but she's originally from, her family's originally from Cameroon, I believe. Um, so she claims French African and she's often like, oh, you know, Black people are so far removed. Black Americans are so far removed from Africa. You can't say you're African Americans. You're just Black Americans, and, and you know that, that brings up like a conversation like all the time because people are like, "What are you saying?" Uh, <laughs> and in some way, I want my birthright. You know what I mean? Like, like I want my birth. I, I get to walk around in the in the skin, right? Yeah. And I get treated. Like, uh, uh, even though I was born here, I get treated like I'm from somewhere else. So it's like, I want my birthright, yeah. right? And then other people are like, well, it's really not your birthright. You mm -hmm. need to seek that where you live. And so there's this conversation that never took place that we see acted out in that story. Killmonger represented a very urban ideal of who African-Americans are. Not only that, um, through even the markings on his body, he showed that he was still trying to capture some semblance of what it means to be African, but through the lens of Americans, right? Right. right. And so when he went there, he still wasn't accepted. He still wasn't, and I don't think he actually wanted to be. I want. I think he wanted to remake Wakanda mm -hmm. in an African American perspective, right? right. And so this, we're, we're going through like. Who's going to? Who's going to? What perspective is going to win, right? Yep. And even I'll, I'll take it one step further. And one of the things that I noticed was, is that uh, colonialism is not necessarily a physical act; it's a psychological act, right? And yep. when Killmonger got there, he turned black uh, African against African, Wakandan against Wakandan. It became very similar to the same type of situation oh, we have here. Right. Yeah. Right? As opposed to everyone working together, everybody, you know, doing their own thing and every there, there's peace and harmony. When his mentality was uploaded into the matrix of Wakanda, it was detrimental to who they were as a people. And it's very reminiscent of what happened when not only slave ships show up, but the mentality that was brought with it infected that continent. Right? So I think it overshadowed, you know, it, it highlighted these dynamics that were never talked about before in a movie. So I, I just want to add that, you know, as, as, we're, as we're talking about this topic in particular, I um, was thinking about how, how uh, T'Challa, uh, so, so you have these differences, they're having this conversation, the conversation is, is uh, you know, to the audience is the fight. <laughs> Right? right it's like that's that's what it comes down to he goes over the waterfall and t'challa has to look within himself and really find a common ground um that might even go against all that he was brought up to know and so i think what's fascinating about that is is you know like we talk a lot about, you know, in different ways, but it's like um, the difficult discussion may not have a, you know, straightforward solution, but right. in the film, we get, we get the solution, you know, based on the character T'Challa, the king, you know, so, so then if we go back to the storytelling, the, the three act structure, it's like that moment where he gets that, you know, he, he rises, he knows what to do, and and he acts it out, he acts upon it. But but it's still not an easy choice. It's still not a you know it's 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 not easy. It's not it's not uh you know there's a lot of gray in 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 that in that conclusion. But the fact that they had the conversation, the fact the fact that they uh, presented it to to the viewers. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. I think that this is re reminiscent of Greek tragedies. 
you know, where there's no solution, only outcomes. Mm. Right. And that's, and that's really what was interesting about the storytelling to me is like, because in real life, solutions are very, very, very hard to find. Right. Mm -hmm. There's usually just outcomes and those outcomes are beneficial to some detrimental to others. And that's the, the nature of an outcome. Right. Some are going to be in favor. Some are going to fall from favor. And so for me, when we see the outcome of T'Challa winning, that means there was a different relationship with the border tribe, right? Because the border tribe fought with Killmonger. It's a different outcome. <laughs> then there's all those ships that went out and now have to come back following the borders <laughs> of a different king, right? So there's also the kind of this patriarchal narrative that uh, Killmonger really didn't embrace the Dura Milaje and how they felt about being in a space of kind of being reduced and having their roles dismissed. That was a whole thing, right? Yeah. So I think it touched on so many subjects, colonialism, patriarchy. It was like <laughs> so much just <laughs> sitting on the chest of, of so many people, which is why it was so successful. Mm. Any thoughts on that? Well, absolutely. That's why it's successful. I mean, I, it, it, you know, it wasn't just bringing up uh, a lot of topics in the, the black community. Uh, among black people, it was like bringing up topics, you know, how we look at each other socially, how we look at like history, uh, race in America. I mean, I think mm -hmm. just merely the title alone, Black Panther, is going to elicit, uh, you know, an emotional response. People are like, Black Panther, is, is it going to be like a superhero with a leather jacket? And, <laughs> right, right. And a beret. Yeah. And a beret and uh, like cruise around with a shotgun and that Black Panther. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Like this movie just immediately put these different images, and <laughs> for all of those, I, I really think it you know it took uh, it took a lot of our preconceived ideas and just moved it to a different direction. Paul, um, you put your finger on something so interesting. For a whole generation, those two words together mean something completely different now. Exactly right. Yeah. Black Panther meant a trial, I think, in Chicago in the sixties <laughs> for me. Uh, uh, and, and now it it doesn't. Right, right. <laughs> you know, once I heard a comment recently. Um, it was talking about uh, socialism, and uh, uh, somebody made the observation. You know, so socialism to one generation means like all these uh, other you know uh, societies that failed or were enemies of America uh, and, and this that and the other. So it's like a negative thing. And uh, somebody said, "Well, socialism to a millennial." Means free healthcare, college, <laughs> uh, and, you know, <laughs> and Uncle Bernie, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so you get all these new concepts, and you just take them in a different direction, and you know, suddenly they can be positive. And it's just like, what's happened? With, well, what was done, in my opinion, with Black Panther? Um, again, you think Black Panther, and for a subset of society, it's a negative thing. I mean, for me, it was a negative thing, but I can see how other people might react to it, you know? I mean, I know I would react to if, uh, you know, there was a, you know, a superhero, like, you know, the White Klansman, you know? Whoa, 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 I thought we established that, you know? Uh, <laughs> no, D.W. Griffith made that film. Oh, well, he, he right. didn't, actually, that was. Right, yeah. That's exactly right. what that was. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> You started the industry that way, Paul. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's hysterical, man. You would think you'd know that, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> they showed me that, Paul. Did, did they show you that? And I mean, they oh showed God, me that. I've seen it numerous times. Yeah, yeah. Three classes in film school. They made us watch uh, Birth of an Eight. Yeah, yeah, the original. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Oh, my gosh. That's exactly what it was, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the Birth of Nation, famous for inventing the. Close up and celluloid racism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two keepers. You know, so so I, I think that these are I think mm. I think we kind of arrived at this idea that, you know, everybody has their own it, it's like looking at the same picture through a different frame. Like yeah. everybody has their own frame and their own struggle, and it was reflected back. And I don't think that we saw that in very many other movies, where it could reach so many people. And I really, it really shows that the struggle, struggle is something that we all resonate with mm -hmm. on oh, yeah. some level. It doesn't matter your age, race, ethnicity. 
anything. And I think that was what was beautiful about that storytelling. You know, so when I was, when the, when the movie was first coming out, I had, I, I wanted to see it. And there was a lot of hype and they were already selling the merch, you know, selling the swag. And um, I got into an elevator and I saw this little Mexican kid get in. He had full Black Panther regalia. Full Black Panther regalia. And I can't tell you how it warmed my heart to see a little boy dressing as a black superhero. Right? Not only black, but African superhero. Mm -hmm. Like, one that speaks like Nelson Mandela and leads like Martin Luther King. You know what I mean? Like, to be in that space, to be able to sit in that elevator and have this little boy look up at me in my face and be proud of wearing this thing, it warmed my heart, man. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's so it so did because there was only white superheroes for me. And yeah. I used to have the under rules with the, you know, with the thing on them, you know what I'm saying, with the Spider-Man, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, or, or Captain America, right? And, and again, Captain America was, you know, this giant white figure, you know, larger than life. Superman was this larger than life character, and now there's this little boy on an elevator, proud to be wearing this outfit it warmed me so much uh how do you guys feel like you know it, it touched you what it, what about the movie or about the concept or about the story or mm-hmm. anything about the characters that really touched you was there any parts in general well i mean i let me ask you how did you feel orpheus when you saw killmonger sit on his throne I was a little conflicted. <laughs> I'm sitting. I was conflicted as hell. <laughs> Didn't that feel horrible? And remember the the lady with the spear? I'll just call her that. Remember how conflicted she was? And she said, I serve that whoever sits on oh. that throne. Anger, that 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 sense of uh need for, you know, revenge, that vengeance that, you know, we can all carry sometimes, right? Mm. And it can be like this amazing, powerful motivator. Um, and that's what makes it, that's what makes it intriguing because it's something that we can all relate to. Like we have those experiences um, where we feel like extreme emotions like that and we get motivated to do things. And then we have T'Challa, which, you know, is the more balanced, like, hey, you know, we, we can't take that, that step, you know, we, we have to have a little bit more compassion Mm-hmm. empathy um and it really asked us you know between those two characters to, to consider like that sense of empathy yeah I, I may agree with some things with uh like killmonger right but at the same time the way in which you 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 do it or implement those plans or um just hold those perspectives or those opinions general may not be the best way um i really felt like t'challa was like that that fantastic balanced character who was flawed and had to grow um but he always had like that moral sensibility that uh, i think you always want in your hero Mm. you know they'll have their struggle but there's that moral grounding that brings them back i mean one of my favorites superman you know, Superman, it wasn't all about his, his amazing, fantastic ability. What also made him super was, like, his 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 moral foundation. Um, you know, in the face of temptation, you know, he'll do the right thing. Um, he'll care about people. Um, it's, it's what we aspire to a lot of times. That's what all these heroes represent. In, in Marvel, in, in any movie, your hero is sometimes we aspire to uh, as, as individuals, as human beings, you know, the best of us. And I think just, I just, I just love that Killmonger character because, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, you almost feel like he's, he's right. And you get so seduced by everything that Killmonger's saying, you, you almost <laughs> know that, right? But then you get brought back and it's like, no, there's a better way. Um, there's, there's a a bit more moral way. Um, it doesn't have to be like that. We don't have to go immediately to killing and rage. And uh, that's what I like in that dynamic between those two. What are your thoughts? Uh, John, you want to chime in on any of that? Well, it was, um, 
my emotional connection to the film was on the father and son level mm -hmm. um, because every guy I've ever known, well, not every, but almost all, and literary characters have some sort of conflict with a father. And of course, T'Challa did have a conflict with his father's past, which he found out about. And, you know, my, I, I had conflicts with my father, very serious ones. Uh, that had to be resolved and were resolved in the last years of his life. And there, are, I still have a chance to uh, resolve some with my son. And one of the ways I did was taking up his invitation to go see this movie. He, mm. he felt mm. it was very important that I see this film with him. Mm. And I don't think he had an, a real uh, motive underneath, except for a night out. But it, he wanted me to see this film and yeah. because he loved the character and he wanted me to get in the Marvel universe before it passed me by completely. And I did. And it meant a lot to me to share this with him uh, on so many levels. That's fantastic. Man, Cause um, you know, all the articles I read about the director, uh, Ryan Coogler, you know, he talks about how he grew up, uh, you know, there were movies that he would go see with his father. You know, so they hear stories like that, man. It's like, man, I'm sure that, <laughs> that, that director just feels great knowing, like, those stories like that out there. <laughs> Pete, you guys thoughts? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think I think my biggest my biggest connection is is what I already uh, mentioned earlier was uh, seeing T'Challa on the screen and representing a man that um, that I can relate to, that I want to relate to, that. Um, I think that I, I was talking to somebody the other day and we were talking about, um, that we need to see more men characters that carry these kind of characteristics that T'Challa does, um, you know, confident, strong, still a warrior, but, um, able to, able to, uh, communicate and, uh, elegant as well as articulate but again that's a lot i think uh, Ch uh chadwick um you know being a, a person you know of his caliber and um uh, bringing that um so yeah i, I think uh, to me that's you know but as we're talking i'm like oh i kind of like that character too <laughs> um, <laughs> um but you know and and the humor I forgot. I forgot. Uh, I, I recently saw that clip where uh, <laughs> he's walking. He's walking into the uh, the. It was like the James Bond thing, you know. It was like there was like the the suits and that kind of stuff. And he's like Wakanda, right? Wakanda. And then um, all of a sudden, uh, the the sister pulls out the camera. She's gonna videotape him, right? And he's like, "What is that?" And he's like, "Just for reference." And then he kicks it. And he's like, delete it. <laughs> so it's just like, yeah. Oh, and what are those? You know, they brought, they brought. What are those? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the old and the new. It, it's a beautiful thing. And you don't see that often. You don't see that kind of care. Um, so I, yeah, you know, it, it's definitely, it's definitely through conversation. It's definitely through uh, talking about it and the research that, I've done after seeing the film um, that I feel more connected because prior to, like I mentioned in, at the start, I didn't know too much. I, yeah. So. Do you think? What do you think? I think one of the things that I, I that's kind of resonating for me too is this idea around masculinity, right? You know, that's what we're talking about. In, in one case, you have um, two strong male figures on different ends of the spectrum where I, I would dare to say that, that you could say or make a strong argument mm -hmm. that uh, Killmonger is hyper-masculine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, he just threw away his relationships with someone who was absolutely in love with him, committed a crime for him, you know? Um, and then you have this loving narrative with uh, Black Panther and uh, I forgot her name, uh, the character's name, uh, with the Lu Lupita Nyong'o yeah. character. Yeah. Um, you know, on both ends, you, you have yeah. this thing. And what I kind of feel like, and, and I often talk about with men in my classes, is that um, masculinity is often performative. 
it's a performance, right? And so how you're performing masculinity, where, when, and how is really what's going to determine whether it's toxic or not, mm. right? Mm. The way you're using your masculinity, if you're wielding it as a weapon, as a form of intimidation, it becomes toxic, right? But when you're using it at, from a point of a leadership, when you're not, when you're confident in who you are, uh, your role in society, your role in the relationship, your role with your partner, when you're comfortable in all those places, masculinity becomes something very different. How do you see those, those characters? Does, does anybody see anything uh, with masculinity or even femininity in this, uh, in these places? Well, you might have to start a baseline if you're going to have that headline, man, uh, and, you know, you had to define masculinity. Um, and that becomes something that's, you know, subjective, you know. Um, is it? Is it really? <laughs> is it really? <laughs> is it? Is masculinity based on your gender? Or is masculinity based on your role? You know, because some people would argue that uh, Okoye, the general for the Dormelage, is very masculine. Mm -hmm. You know, yet at the same time, very feminine. Well, technically, masculinity is the measure by which a society determines the characteristics that it finds valuable in its male body individuals, right? Mm -hmm. And so. The United States says we want you to be strong, we want you to be rugged, we want you to be a go-getter, we want you to be uh, good with the women, because all these things really make for good soldiers, right? We want mm -hmm. you to be obedient, compliant, um, you know, we want you to be able to take orders, like all those things are really what it values in the society, okay? Right. And I think that we saw some of this in Killmonger, right? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Then, so basically, masculine is the measurement of with a society. So you, you can see uh, M. Hotep said, don't make the measure your master. Uh -huh. And that's where we start getting into toxic masculinity where your your whole life is to try and measure up to this ideal that some somebody somewhere at some point in time said you should be. Uh -huh. But Wakanda's operating a whole different scale. Yeah. What it finds valuable is different. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I thought it was really interesting to see you know, these other, you know, this, the, their, their societal norms through just how T'Challa carried this. Well, I don't know about um, y you fellows, but I feel pretty much that I've, my masculinity is a program. Um, mm. In fact, m multiple programs that were downloaded in me before the word downloaded was the word downloaded. <laughs> <laughs> when, when it didn't exist, and I did, and Every cartoon I watched, especially Bugs Bunny, um, Bugs Bunny, mm -hmm. the way he reacted to women, I mean, that I was programmed to re react to women like that. When you see a woman that is magnificent in your eyes, the eyes should split into three parts with the pupil coming out of here. <laughs> and there should be steam <laughs> coming out of your ears and your tongue. This is important. This is important, gentlemen. If you're truly a man, your tongue will roll <laughs> out and hit with a thud on the floor. <laughs> Otherwise, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> or mandible just like elongating down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and there are sound effects too, but I hesitate. Uh, I add them. Yeah. <laughs> they're all yours. All yours, they're all yours. I won't do them. <laughs> I've come a long way, uh, and 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 when I see when I'm in Wakanda, I'm being reprogrammed. I'm seeing women with spears, and they are resolute as any image of manhood I've ever known. Mm -hmm. And in their presence stands a man who is perfectly at home in this realm. And even the little white guy is at home with these truly indomitable females. There's a place for me there, too. And there, this is serious reprogramming. And I, I, I need it. I, I, didn't, I didn't identify with Killmonger because uh, I smelled third act death all over him. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, we could argue that even it, because, again, 
masculinity doesn't have a gender, you know, mm -hmm. and like you said, it is a mm -hmm. programming. And, and again, we're just using different language. You know, what we're saying is that so, so, there's been a, a, a program, if you will, that's established and it says what we value. Here's the things. Here's what we value. Here's what we're measuring. But masculinity is a measure. Right. It's, it definitely is a measure. Like we have inches. You know, it, 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 it's, it, that's the thing. It is not a thing. What we choose to measure is something totally different. Right. Yeah. And I think, again, you can also argue that uh, the spears in the hands of Dura Malage uh, from a Freudian standpoint would be phallic. Right. And emblematic of the character to say these are tough people. These they, they're carrying these artifices of phalluses with them everywhere they go and they're protecting the king and they're in this masculine role. But even that wasn't toxic. No, their idea, you know, for some right. reason, it was comfortable. Yes. To watch and even beautiful, and they still, I, I found them stunningly uh, attractive on, on some level, which yeah. I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. Their their masculine didn't make me feel like mine was in jeopardy no, or that they were imitate. They weren't portraying st masculine stereotypes. They were strong, tough individuals embracing a warrior yeah. archetype that was emblematic of who they were. It was created for them, identified with them, and that's all it was. They were not trying to be men. No. Right. You see what I'm saying? Okay. And that was refreshing about them. Remember, the program, if, if I'm correct, that there is a program of gender, um, just because I no longer, um, no longer utilize it doesn't mean the program is non-existent. Mm -hmm. It's still there for anyone who, run, who wants to run it, of any race and of any sex. I mean, if a, if a woman runs the program, um, good luck to her, because it's, it's a crude program, and it excludes people, uh, as I recall, and, it, and it's about domination, but the program's still there. Mm -hmm. It could be rewritten, but it doesn't go away. Either does the archetype. Uh, a woman uh, can assume any of our archetypes. And uh, I put up fingers for those of you who may not see <laughs> our archetypes. Yeah. So it's I, available to all of us. What do you think are the long-term hmm. ramifications of this movie? Where, where do you think it's going? The, the cultural significance of this long-term is going to be? Uh, I have an opinion about that, but I was going to let John go since uh, mm -hmm. he's a little shorter on time than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll make it brief. Um, <clears throat> I think Wakanda is a vision of a future in which um, we can all feel a little better about ourselves. I thought it transcended race. Ultimately, it wasn't about race for me at all. I have to tell you, even though it was all over the place and you can't, <laughs> that wasn't the overriding theme. The overriding theme was so universal, that we all have gifts within us to contribute. What could be more beautiful than that? Mm -hmm. To walk down the street and know that you have a universe within. And mm -hmm. any kid of any race who, who identifies with Wakanda, and I, I teach in a K-8 school, I know what children are thinking about this mythical place. They see themselves as having an inner Wakanda, and they don't have to lord it over people they are there to contribute this inner wisdom. And mm. all of us can feel that we have gifts to give, even if people don't recognize it. And even perhaps it's best if we don't make them recognize it all the time, but gently, humbly contribute this genius that comes from our deepest springs. Mm. Wow, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. And thank you for seeing it and contributing. I appreciate that. Um, I'm staying oh, to hear everybody else, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> wow. Who wanted to go next? I think we're already starting to see it. Um, and I don't think it took uh, the quarantine or anything. We're starting to see like more stories in Hollywood with black characters doing things like we haven't seen stories with black characters uh, doing. Um, you know, one of the examples I, I'll bring up, I'm really into this new series on HBO, Lovecraft Country, mm. right? 
And I, I was just like, man, it's so great. Like the, after the first episode, I was like, it's so great to see like black lead characters uh, in a sci-fi kind of action story where they're the leads. The stories are about them. They're navigating their own world, and and that's that was like primarily the biggest thing that I took from from Black Panther, and I just see it just like washing over the rest of the, the industry. It's seeing black people uh, in a future sense, mm-hmm. like in a society, like all black people, and they're taking care of one another. They're independent, um, and it's almost demanding that, you know, the rest of the world or society in, in real life look at black people as, you know, the group of people that have extremes like every other race. You know, um, I feel like too often in society, um, people look at black people, it's, they have to be this way, this way, this way. Like, there, there's no room for, for parity and, and personality. Like, we're not one homogenous group with a bored mind, mm. you know? And I think that's what what, uh, what Black Panther illustrated. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't like a group of people who who live off of the government. Like, they were flourishing, they had businesses, <laughs> they had little tribes, all these things were reflected. Uh, and I see, like, so much of uh, where I feel so much of what society sees about black people um, just get broken up and put on the screen uh, in Black Panther. And, and I love that. And I just see it going forward, man. I just see so many, um, I just he- and I hear about like so many other stories revolving around black people um, or just not even black people, just people other than white. And there's nothing wrong with white actors and white stories. But be real, like Hollywood, that's all the stories have been, you know? Every other race um, has been like a subset or derivative of these primary stories that we, we hear from white people. And Black Panther was like a big, like kind of pounding state moving mm. forward. I mean, honestly, yeah, it's only two characters, that were, uh, only two non-black characters were the government agent and uh, Ulysses Claw. Mm. you know? Everybody else in the movie was black, you know. <laughs> that was that was awesome to me. Yeah. <laughs> this was, and, uh, just to see it yeah. presented, it just like just a, an awesome, positive way, and you know, and, and all these people, you know, immediately after the movie, reading like, "Oh, it's it's fiction. It was made up by a white guy. Like, why are you taking so much pride in it if you're black and you can't? Because you know what? It's fiction. It made up by a, like, <laughs> the image alone." influences you know and a lot of times you might have the seed already you don't have to plant the seed people feel good about it but sometimes you just gotta water and i I feel like black panther was just like a nice little bit of water with some some extra vitamins and some extra (laughs) you know uh protein shake and you know (laughs) and i I just Mm. it was just great to see and I just I feel like it's gonna it has influenced a lot of Hollywood already. Sounds good. Sounds great. Wow. Pete, you wanna go? <laughs> well yeah, I obviously wanna <laughs> I wanna say something, <laughs> but ah, uh, you know you know, I've been reading the different articles. There's a there's a couple of old old good old goodies. Uh New York Post had a good one, um and Times, uh Time magazine. And reading those articles alone kind of kind of summed up so much, but in, in great detail with words. <laughs> um, so f- for me, like, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I have any more to add to what people have said, because um, that's, that's exactly what I've been thinking, but I will, I will just add my flavor. And I heard uh, Chadwick Boseman and Michael B. Jordan talking on this, uh, I think it was in London, and they ask him, what does Black Panther mean to you? And Chadwick Boseman said, the substance of faith. Mm. And to me, and I think, it, I think it had to do with, with him not being here anymore. But um, 
like I like I can't relate exactly the same as far as as far as my race, but but what Black Panther, the the world of Wakanda, uh, what it represents is the possibilities, you know, and um, <clears throat> and you know, and I really didn't know much about it, but I remember how excited Orpheus was. Um, the day, the day, I think, was it the day after you saw it? I think. Um, and he's like, I'm going back to watch it for the third, third time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, inside, I was like, what, why? Like, <laughs> like what's so, you know, it, cause I'm thinking, oh, it's a Marvel movie, but just like today, the talk, the joy, like in, in your eyes, in your smile, um, and, and, you know, you, you know, being my best friend, knowing, knowing what you've shared with me, it's like, like Black Panther to me is the substance of faith. It's like, it, we can have that conversation as long as we're not afraid to have it. We, we can, we can talk about the Eric Killmongers. We can talk about the T'Challa's. We can talk about all these characters if we're not afraid to, to, to have that conversation. And I think, I, you know, I'm somebody who believes in a lot of spirituality and, and, and the universe and things happening for a reason. So I, I, I have been really taking the Chadwick Boseman, you know, his passing away really, really to heart because I feel like he represented the kind of person that, that I, I desire to be. And I, I think I already am, but I just don't, you know, don't have that stage. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you. But goodness, you know, love. Uh, we talk, a, you shared this with me a lot, Orpheus, U Ubuntu. Um, I am because we are. Yeah, you know, and uh, the ancestors and all this stuff that we need to have more conversations about. We need to, we can't forget these things that are, more important than than just what's you know what what we what we get every day you know so i think black panther to me is is all of that and so for the future i mean like that little boy you saw in the elevator that's all that's that's the you know we start with that so nice thank you mm -hmm. i appreciate you sharing that mm -hmm. personally i think that you know what it brought was a simple fact that you can use archetypes and not stereotypes to fuel your your movies, your stories. You know, I mean, that in and of itself is, is the most important piece. You know, for, for decades, uh, maybe, maybe since the inception of the film industry, it is capitalized on stereotypes. And it's really on what, one, the, do, what the dominant group thinks about every, themselves and everyone else. Right. That is really what has been the uh, the hallmarks of Hollywood storytelling. And I think that it blew that out of the water. Right. The other thing is really that the narratives, there's really rich and deep narratives that exist all over the world that you can tap into. We do not have to keep recycling the same stories, the same uh, ethos, you know, it does, it does not have to be there. We can reach into many different frames, many different perspectives, because stories are universal. And they help us learn a little bit about each other at every place. And I think to, to kind of riff on uh, Pete Wong's um, thing, what it also makes me realize as a person who's spiritual, is that English doesn't have a lot of language to really embrace the spiritual, the intangible, right? We don't have a language to talk about ancestral narratives and their roles in our lives or, or ancestor worship or, uh, you know, deep family ties that are not biological. And I think that on some level, Black Panther started exploring that. It start, it's going to serve as maybe the hieroglyphs for which we base spiritual mm -hmm. conversations um, in the future, right? 
there, there's a say there's a there's a word uh, I believe it's obutuasa, which means when the spirits open up another path on your another path on yours, you know, another door for you to step through. That doesn't exist anywhere else, but everybody's had the experience where they're like, I've been going here and now this opportunity just kind of popped up out of nowhere. Should I take it? Right? And we don't know if we should or shouldn't, but we don't have a name to really describe that thing. When we see um, Wakanda in this way, we see another path. Another opportunity. We can strive for another level of excellence. And that, to me, is its legacy that we can, this one movie is going to serve as a stepping stone for the next movie to have different and more meaningful conversations about who we are as human beings. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate this, man. I think this was a great, great conversation. I hope everybody felt good about it, and I hope when people watch this and and they put their comments in and and say what they think and share their thoughts and ideas, that they get a little healing and a little closure around the death of Chadwick Boseman and the uncertainty of this thing. So, on behalf of me and Pete Wong. Mm. I just want to say uh, thank you guys for showing up and. Uh, can we do the? Can we do the thing? Oh, can we do Wakanda? Yeah. <laughs> Wakanda forever, Chronic man. forever. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. It was a pleasure. Bye, everybody. <laughs>